Hey, welcome everybody to what to me is my first webinar. It's going to be a little interesting sort of talking to myself. I'd um, like to lay the groundwork for the next 30 minutes, roughly. Game plan here is to talk about, you know, saw chain and really specifically the cutter tooth. And I could use this tooth. Or we can talk about this tooth. Or we can talk about this tooth. <clears throat> right? Much easier to see things. Why this webinar? <clears throat> Over the years of teaching chainsaw safety, production cutting, and so on, um, it's pretty clear that there's a lot of folks don't understand how the tooth works. So that's the point of the webinar here tonight. It's not the um, hand, file in the hand, hold this angle, use this file guide, and that sort of thing. We actually made a DVD, and Dave Birdsaw, I think, can put that up on the screen, and Kathleen can put a, uh, our link to it. And that DVD, that shows the, the how-to of actually filing the saw, the how-to and the when and some of the different filing guides out there. This is the why. Why is that tooth shaped the way it is? Why do we hear some folks who are pretty knowledgeable in chain, loggers, arborists, you know, they make their living with a saw. Why would we hear them saying, well, I don't like a new chain out of the box. I do. And they'll change that chain. They'll, they'll modify it. What are they doing? <clears throat> Why would we do that? Why wouldn't a new chain be perfectly fine? We're going to go through this cutter tooth. <clears throat> I'm going to take it. There's five different parts of a cutter tooth. We're going to go through them one at a time. I'd like the pre one more little preempt is there's three things I like to consider why the new chain is shaped the way it is, why it's filed the way it is right out of the box. One is lawyers. Lawyers. The companies that make saw chain. The companies that make chainsaws, their lawyers are deathly afraid of a lawsuit coming their way from an injury that some lawyer can show that their product caused a severe injury. So they need to make a product that is usable, but not too dangerous. Okay. Second issue that we want to consider on why the chain is sharpened and shaped the way it is right out of the box is the engineers that made this chain and the different styles of chain, they have no idea where that chain is going to be used, who's going to be using it, the experience of the user, the saw engine size, the bar length, the wood, frozen, soft, dirty. They have no idea. So they need to make a product that's kind of usable. But if we understand how this thing works, then we, the end user, can make those little adjustments to make it work for us. OK. There's a third thing. Um, just kidding. I remembered the third thing. OK. It's first impression. I'm going to come back to that phrase, first impression. If you're in business, anybody that knows business knows the value and the importance of that almighty first impression. OK? And we'll come back to that here in a minute. Let's get started. Got your pencils. We're going to talk first about this guy right up here. OK? This, by the book, you would find is called a depth gauge, OK? It has a lot of nicknames. I grew up calling it a raker, OK? I've heard it called drags, riders. There's, there are, are regional um, nicknames. 
Okay, it's a depth gauge. What does it do? Why is it there? If I were to take a straight edge and hold this on a brand new chain, and I'm hoping I'm going to work the light here a little bit so you can see the top of that depth gauge. If you can see the top of the depth gauge on your screen, right? Okay. And then you see the top of that cutter tooth, and you notice that I'm down a little bit. And that term, a little bit, is the thickness of the chip. This depth gauge is limiting how far that tooth can go into the wood. Now to help me to help us see this, I've got a few props here and I wanna show you quick, I have a piece of wood. And I have here, what represents a piece of wood. A piece of wood is really a bundle of fiber, very tightly packed, right? It's hard wood. And the fibers run in a line like I have in my room here. Okay, I'm gonna go to a little bit smaller tooth. But when that tooth strikes the wood, it wants to sink right down into that wood and it would keep right on going if it wasn't for the depth gauge. To give you a visual, I gathered up some chips here today out on the job. And let me see if I can hold that. So when I talk about the thickness of the chip, I like to say it's basically or roughly the thickness of a business card. Okay, that's the thickness. So the chip has length, it has width, and then it has thickness. I want to do a little disclaimer right off. If you happen to see a brand name on some of my little props here, we're not, not you know, talking up or down or anybody's brand chain. I just happen to have some props here. I do happen to know that on Oregon chain, if you look on Oregon chain, right on the side of the depth gauge, you should see a number, okay? And it would be right there. On the Oregon chain that we run, your standard chain, you're gonna see a 25 there. That 25 is telling us that right out of the box, the engineers set the thickness of that chip at 25 thousandths of an inch. That will cut wood okay, okay? Loggers, Folks that are using a saw to make a living, you'll often hear them take that down a little bit. They're going to thicken that chip up just a little bit, maybe 30 thousandths. You know, it'll make the saw cut a little faster. It's going to take a little more horsepower. Okay. As we sharpen the tooth, you'll notice that the tooth is taller in the front than it is in the back. Every time we file the tooth, we shorten it ever so slightly, which means that working corner is dropping. We have what we like to show as a depth gauge filing guide. Okay, and they look something like this. At a quick glance, if I hold still, you'll see that they look very similar. But when I hold those right beside each other, I think now you can see the difference. You notice the hole on one is a little closer to the end, okay? They're marked as 325 or 38. You're going to see that stamped right on the plate. But you need to be sure that you're using the correct gauge for your chain. And that's a whole nother webinar. And we do cover that a little detail in that DVD, okay? How that's used. I made a plate. Here's what we're doing. When we put that file plate on a new chain, we should see, if I get that light just, I'm going to poke that depth gauge up there just a little bit, right there. If I can get that light, but there we go, right there. That should be just flush right there on a new chain. Nothing's changed. 
But as we've sharpened the teeth, remember this point is going to be dropping in elevation, so to speak. It's going to be lowering. So each time we file, that depth gauge would be coming through a little bit more. So each time we file the tooth, that chip is going to be getting ever so slightly thinner. You, if you don't file this down occasionally, those chips will eventually get so thin that you're really making more of a saw dust than a saw chip. You're going to find yourself trying to push on the saw because it, the tooth simply isn't getting into the wood. The teeth are sharp, but the depth gauge just isn't allowing the cutting edge to get into the wood. This is a little tough to nail down on how often you need to file those depth gauges down. I'm going to give you a, a bare minimum, at least four times throughout the life of your chain, at least four times. The more often you do it, the more you're going to keep that right in that sweet spot where the saw wants to cut wood. You don't have to push on it much, but it's not pulling the saw out of your hand or shoving it back at you. We call those reactive forces. Okay, the, there's three of those reactive forces. I can show you very quickly here. If we're cutting through a log and we're going downward, right? The reaction is going to pull the saw away from you. If you're gonna come up under a log, that's gonna push it back at you. And if you've been around saws, you are probably aware, I hope, the danger of the kickback corner. And that corner is right here. Okay, that's a reaction. And that drives the bar up toward you. That's why we call it kick back. It's kicking back toward the operator we saw. When those chips, if, if the chips are too thick, tooth is biting into the wood too much, the thick, the chip is too thick, that reaction, okay, is going to increase dramatically and the saw becomes very dangerous, even more dangerous than it already is when everything is right. Be very careful filing that down. You got to know what it is. It sets the thickness of the chip. There's one. Number two is the point on the tooth. We have a side plate and a top plate, and then we have what we call, we'll, we'll refer to it as a point or a working corner, really the same thing. I'd like to switch to a different model because it, the point is a little better defined, okay? If you see there, if I, right there, you see where I got that straight top plate, straight side plate, and that creates a nice working corner or a point. What does that point do? Why, why do we need to know what that point is? It's really important to understand its job. That point, its job in life is to hook, I go to my broom, right? That point, its job in life is to hook that fiber. Once it's hooked that fiber, that tooth will naturally sink into the wood until that depth gauge hits the wood. That stops the, you know, stops the tooth from going in, and then you start carving the chip out. If we lose that point ever so slightly, and I'm talking about you really, you have to look close. And the older you get, you might, might need some aids to see how little that point can be gone. And because the fiber is so fine, the tooth will start to slide over the wood instead of hooking into the fiber. I'd like to go to a real piece of wood. Okay, and if I hold really still, I'm hoping you see that hair-like fine fiber. Can we appreciate that 
if we take a tooth, a real chain, and that really fine hair-like fiber, and we lose that point ever so slightly, okay? It's not going to hook into the wood and self-feed. We will get the feeling from the handlebars of that saw that the chain is getting dull. The reality is it could be that we've just lost the point, okay? The harder the wood, and of course, any kind of grit, you know, certainly metal, but usually, you know, that's an extreme, that's damaging the chain, but I'm talking about the cutting edge just getting a little bit dull or that sweet, I want to cut wood feel, that self-feed. We can lose that by that point peening over ever so slightly, and we've got to sharpen up that working corner. Okay, that's two. We've got the depth gauge that sets the thickness of that chip. We've got the point that's going to hook in, that needs to hook into that fiber. Now we're going to go to two cutting edges. There are, we call them plates, okay? There's a top plate and the side plate. Both of those have a very specific job and they're actually different. They, they need to be filed at, at their correct angle. So let's take them one at a time. Let's talk about the side plate, this side cutting edge, okay? That side cutting edge needs to cut the fiber off. And I've been doing this talk, it's, I've actually come to kind of think of it as the tooth talk. I have been doing this tooth talk for a lot of years. And it's really interesting how many folks running saws are kind of surprised when I explain that it's this side cutting edge that pays the bills. This does the work. But when we file, let me go to, I'm going to go to this tooth here. Okay, here's my file. I think we could agree when we're filing, we tend to be looking at the top plate, right? That's our, that's our field of vision, our, our angle of view. We look at the top plate and it kind of makes sense. This tooth has got to go through the wood and that cutting edge has got to get the wood out of the way. So that cutting edge needs to be sharp. Sure, it needs to be sharp, but this side cutting edge is really doing the work. I'm going to come back to this and I'm going to throw out a trivia question. And that's going to, if somebody can answer the trivia question, then I'm going to know that they're really with us. Okay. Side plate cuts the fiber off. Top cutting edge is popping the chip out. Two different jobs. Side cutting edge cuts the fiber off. Top cutting edge is going to pop the chip out. Let me illustrate that with a real piece of wood, okay, and a knife. So if, I, if I'm putting the cutting edge this way to this piece of wood, then you see where that would be cutting the fiber off. When I turn the cutting edge 90 degrees to it, that would be popping the chip out. I'm guessing that most of us here, if you're interested in chainsaws, you can appreciate how much more power it's going to take to try to push a cutting edge right directly across that fiber and cut that fiber off. And I'm going to try to do this without getting cut, but I've got to really drive that in with a whole lot of force to try to get that, push that in there. Now, when I come to the 90 degree angle to that, I can pop that chip out almost with my fingertips. Okay, that comes out very easily. 
that's the difference between the side cutting edge and your top cutting edge. This pays the bills in the sense that this is what's when you hear your saw getting pulled down and drawing the power out of your you know, out of the saw, okay, and you feel that pulling effect or pushing those reactive forces. I would guess by far 80 plus percent of that is coming from this side cutting edge trying to cut that fiber off. That's the hard job. The top cutting edge, that's simply popping that out. If there's any carpenters, you know, in the group here, I think you can appreciate, you know, making a uh, a notch for a door hinge. When you're going straight down, you need a hammer, right? You're, you've got to cut that fiber off. And then you just lower that chisel and the piece pops out. That's your top plate. Okay. Both of those cutting edges have a proper angle that they should be filed to. I'm going to go to the top plate first. A lot of our chains now have a witness mark. You'll see, get the glare, there we go, okay? So we've got that witness mark right here. That is a filing aid, so that if we keep that top plate, excuse me, that top cutting edge parallel to the witness mark, you're gonna be good. That, that's gonna be pretty good there. That angle, to put some numbers to it, that angle is going to have a little variation depending on the style of chain that you're using. And this here is just a sample of the options. It really can get crazy out there in the marketplace with saw chain. Uh, personal opinion, I think they could eliminate three quarters of those options and we could do whatever we need to do with only a quarter of those, but you know, that's, that's business. They, they got to make an option. Okay. Our top plate angle, those numbers, you're going to see 25 to 30 degrees. That's, that's the range. Okay. We want to stay within that range there, 25 to 30 degrees. The side cutting edge. This is, this is the tricky one. It's kind of weird because if we take a straight edge, okay, let me go back to the top plate for a second. Okay, if I put that straight edge against there, you see I put a straight edge against a straight edge and I can, check, I can measure that angle. That's what an angle is. It's two straight lines coming together. When I put this straight edge against the side plate, how do we measure an angle if we've got a straight line against a curve? The key is how much of that side plate is doing anything. When we go back to where we started, remember the depth gauge sets the thickness of the chip. So it's from the very top of the tooth down to the thickness of the chip, or roughly the thickness of a business card at 25 thousandths of an inch, whatever gives you that, you know, so you understand what I'm talking about, okay? From the point down, represented on my big model here, down to my file, that's the only part of the side cutting edge that's doing anything. From this point down, this all gets sharpened, it becomes sharp, it's a sharp edge, simply because the file, right, is, the file is taking the metal out and it's gonna sharpen it. But let's keep in mind, it's only that very, very little top that's paying the bills. Back to the angle, okay? If we take our straight edge, and go right to the top, but only down ever so slightly. So I'm gonna start straight up and down. And you notice where I'm about 25 to 30 degrees forward, right in that very top. Hmm, 25 to 30 degrees. Where did we hear that before, right? That's over here. 
So really, side cutting edge, that little bit, that little top leans forward the same as your top plate leans backwards, 25 to 30 degrees. Okay. Now I'm going to go back to that all important, that all powerful first impression. What I see, and this is my personal opinion, so we're not going to go to somebody, you know, picking on somebody's product. But what I see, a lot of chain coming right out of the box. Okay, and this one, I don't want to ignore the brand name, <laughs> okay? But I know it's kind of small, but here's my point. The point I'm trying to make. First impression, a lot of chain comes out of the box from the factory with too much hook. Now, why would they do that? Hmm. What too much hook is going to do is the end user right out of the box is going to put that to that wood and they're going to go, wow, I like that chain. That cuts really well. First impression made, done, sealed deal. Now, of course, the chain will become dull. They always do, right? Hardwood, hard wood. we're gonna lose that, that nice sharp edge. I call it be, becoming wood dull, not damaged, just wood dull. But that first impression has been made to where the end user thinks, wow, that name your brand, I like that chain. Here's where it's important to understand what's going on there. When they put that personal opinion, too much hook on the side plate, that point is weak, okay? So if I put that right here, this model we're trying to represent too much hook. So that point is going to be very sharp and that chain will cut rather well, but not for very long. So it's a management issue with this side plate angle. As we, if we bring the side plate angle back, we will strengthen that corner. But if we do it too much, we're gonna create another problem with the fifth part of the tooth, okay? If we have too much hook, we are gonna have a very sharp point right after we file the chain but that point will be relatively weak. The hardness of the wood pings that point down. The tooth starts to slide across the wood instead of hooking that fiber. And we as the end user start to push on the saw. I'm gonna very short segue, okay? How do we get hurt with saws? A lot of times, I mean, if you just sort of ask that as an off the cuff question, well, we get cut with the things. That's absolutely short. Other ways we get hurt is when that chain is either too aggressive and those reactive forces are too strong, that pulling, pushing, and that kickback, okay? That becomes too strong. I kind of say it this way. What we tend to do is compensate by white knuckling the handlebars and our feet get a little further apart, okay? And think about doing this in the woods, in the brush, snow, slippery ground, other people working around you, a very unpredictable product, wood, trees, rock, limbs, so on, okay? So if that chain isn't right, we can get hurt by slips, trips, and falls. We can get hurt in the long run by developing problems in our hands and our wrists from carpal tunnel problems, from too much of that white knuckling us off, back issues, okay? So it's all tied together with um, keeping this chain right where we want it. Now, um, quickly, I, I might be answering some questions that are usually, they're pretty common. Okay, how do we change that side plate angle? I'm gonna answer that question, but we have to make an assumption. The assumption is you have the correct diameter file for your tooth, okay? If that's a correct file for the tooth, 
you should have about 20% of the diameter of your file should be above the cutting, the top plate. And that will give you that 25 to 30 degree tip forward up in the very top. If you're filing, if you start to push downward too much and you're kind of taking the metal out from down in here, each time you stroke the file, the file will incrementally get lower and you'll be adding hook to the side plate and you'll end up with that weak corner again. If you're filing and the pressure is upward, too much upward, you're going to take that hook out. You're kind of chasing that top cutting edge, trying to sharpen it, and you'll stand that side plate up. And that creates another problem. And last, that problem comes from the last part of our tooth. Okay, we started with the depth gauge. That depth gauge is going to determine the thickness of the chip. We're working with a 25 thousandths of an inch right out of the box. And I'm hoping we understand how that influences that reactive force if that chip gets thicker and thinner. There's problems both ways. We've got a point or a working corner hooking that fiber. It's got to be there. Side cutting edge pays the bills, cuts that fiber off. This is doing the work. Top cutting edge, popping the chip out. Okay. Now we're up to number five. I'm going to flip my tooth over. And when I say pop, the chip out, okay, going back to the hammer and chisel, right? Hammer down and then lower the chisel angle and we pop that chip out. Well, that's what's happening here with our, um, use a file as a chip, okay? That chip is going to go out that chisel angle. And that's the name of our, the, the fifth part of our tooth, okay? The chisel angle. I think of it as a little ramp all the way across the underside of the top plate. It makes a little ramp and that's where that chip wants to go. Okay, back to file height. I'm gonna say it again. We have to assume we have the correct diameter file for the style chain that you're sharpening. File height, if we're filing up too high, we're taking that side plate and standing it up. And we will also, at the same time, be taking that chisel angle, get the light just right here, okay? That chisel angle will be going from a nice ramp and it will start to stand up the same way your side plate is, okay? So if that chisel angle starts to become more blunt, I'm hoping you see how that chip is going to have a hard time getting out of there. It's going to be like hitting a wall and your chain will be making more sawdust. It's, it's really pounding its way through the wood or crushing its way through the wood. So we need to be sure proper file diameter, proper file height. Okay. And I'm going to, hopefully I can illustrate this to sort of explain one of the angle, angles you'll see in a chain manual is a 10 degree down with the handle of the file. Instead of being 90 degrees to your bar or horizontal, okay, horizontal to the ground, they'll talk about dropping the handle of the file just 10 degrees. It's not a lot, just a little. And what we're doing there when we do that is to help that chisel angle so it feeds the chip out of there a little easier without creating the hook problem on the side plate. Okay, so it's a little bit of a dance. We want a good chisel angle, but we don't want to create another problem with that side plate having too much hook. That is the five parts of the cutter tooth. Now I'm going to quickly, I've lost track of the time. Oh, Kathleen can chime in. I don't even have a watch here. 741. 741. Yeah. So we've been at this 40 minutes. Mm -hmm. I'm going to wrap this up by, and we're, we're going to go to questions. I'm going to talk about two common terms that are used in saw chain. And I find it interesting that it's really a holdover 
from the old crosscut saw. Okay. I, I mentioned earlier, I grew up calling the depth gauge on the tooth a raker. And it's simply because the old farmers I was working with, that's what they called it. A true raker comes from the crosscut days. Okay. That is a true raker. These are the sharp pointed teeth that cut the fiber off, like what the side plate is doing. And then that would rake the chip out. Now in a crosscut saw, we have this circular cavity. Okay. That is a, it's referred to as a gullet, a true gullet. On saw chain, can you see where that curvature, because of the round file, it, it mimics the look of that gullet in a crosscut saw, okay? It's in manuals, chain manuals, they use that term, gullet, on a saw chain, file the gullet out, okay? I personally think it's kind of important to understand that, personal opinion, it's not a true gullet. The chip is going under the tooth. Let me turn this around, you can see a little better. Okay, the chip is going under the tooth. That's where it goes. And the true gullet space in saw chain, if you look at a saw, or look, at, look at your chain, right? The true gullet space is the gap between teeth. That's where those chips are collecting. Now it's not a perfect science. It's not like an absolute sort of thing, but I do think it's important to understand that the, the, um, the chips don't all just ball up in this tiny little cavity and then fly out at the end of the cut. I mean, if that was happening, your, your chain wouldn't cut an inch into the wood. This would be all jammed up with wood and your cutting edges couldn't cut anymore. The uh, go just, very quickly, you know, if someone looks kind of carefully, if you haven't seen this before, I don't know if you can see it in the video, but I actually have a right and the left cutter and then an extra gap and a right and the left cutter and an extra gap. I use what's referred to as semi-skip chain. Okay, so that's, that gives that chain a little bit larger void, a little larger cavity, if you will, for that, those chips to collect. And that's really, uh, if you run longer bars, you can go to full skip and you'll hear those terms. Most folks, cutting your firewood, okay, common use, it's a, a full comp chain, even gap between all of the teeth, and that works perfectly fine. Okay. Let's go to questions. This should be really interesting. Usually there's piles of them. Uh, you know, they, they are not in the chat box yet. I, I would think, John, that people have been listening and like I have processing everything you've been saying. Okay. You know, like, like I had said to you when we first talked about this, I recognize all the words you use as English, <laughs> but it takes me a little bit to actually know what you're talking about. <laughs> so okay. um, if I could chime in quick. I actually, I skipped over my trivia question. Ah, go really, ahead. Really, really important, I'm gonna throw out the trivia question. We talked about the side plate cutting the fiber off, the top plate cut, flipping the chip out. There are times, and it happens all the time when we're cutting wood, when those two jobs switch, okay? Side plate cuts the fiber off, top plate pops the chip out. When? During the process of cutting a log up, and this is not, I'm not talking about all about ripping a log lengthwise, I'm talking about cross cutting a log. When do those two jobs switch? And the top plate cuts the fiber off and the side plate pops the chip out. Anybody quick got the answer? Because I want to answer it before, I don't know if somebody can chime in quick. Yep, if you have the answer, why don't you unmute and tell us? I'm guessing is when you undercut. No. Nope. <laughs> Somebody else? <laughs> okay, I know it's, I don't wanna take up a lot of time. Here it is. Here's a piece of wood. 
And what I did is I took a marker, okay? And in between the knots, the fiber is running this way. Ah. Okay? And you notice right here, you see, I, I, and I marked it up so it became more clear. You couldn't see it in the video, but you can actually see the grain of the wood start to turn at an angle going into the knot. So the answer to the question, when your chain, I'll just use my hand, okay, to keep things simple here, when your chain hits a knot, the top plate is now needing to cut the fiber off because the fiber is going this way, mm -hmm. not that way. Mm -hmm. The top plate cuts the fiber off, side plate is kicking the chip over, okay? <laughs> and to wrap my little trivia question up, I like to do that to really make sure we understand what's going on. It's why the side cutting edge, the very top, leans forward the same as the top plate leans backwards. Because at 40 miles an hour, going through a log, you're hitting knot, you know, you're cutting knots, then straight wood, and then you're cutting a limb at an angle, the fiber is running all over the place. Those two cutting edges are swapping jobs constantly. Mm. Okay. They both need to be sharp, keep the angle at within that 25 to 30 degree uh, parameter. So I have some questions for you, John. It's quite a few now. Yep. There are. Do you sharpen your chain at less of an angle in the middle of winter compared to warmer summer, warmer months? You're on, does, you're on, you're on the right, right um, track. And does it also depend on softwood or hardwood? Yes, same, same thing. Frozen wood, of course, is going to be a little more dense. So the idea is taking that factory grind and we're thinking about strengthening the cutting edge Okay, so we might take a little less, say 20 degrees on your top plate, that's going to strengthen that side cutting edge up. Taking a little more of the hook out, which is your side plate leaning it back slightly. So we may go to that 20 degrees there. Still needs to be sharp, but the edge will be a little stronger. You're, you're going to give up a slightly little, you'll give up a little cutting speed but you're gaining duration of sharpness. Great, thank you. I'm gonna to try to, um, yeah, recognize the, where the questions are coming from. That was Logan. So um, from Carl, uh, no question, my compliments for the props helps a lot for my understanding. Great. Oh, good. Uh, John, regarding the 10 degree down angle on the file handle when filing, if I look at Oregon's hand filing directions, they call for the 10 degree angle when using a bare file. However, when using the guide that clips onto the file, they say zero degree down <laughs> angle. Why? <laughs> okay. I love that question because here's, here's the way I like to answer that. If we understand how this thing works, what's it doing? What, what are these different parts of the tooth? What, is, what are their jobs? Then we can answer that question for ourselves. If we wanna have that 10 degree down to get a little better chisel angle, to feed that chip out. If it's cold wood, we might not do that 10 degree down to strengthen the top plate. Okay, I'm hoping that uh, answers that question. You're, you're gonna find a little bit of that deviation. There is no absolute, you know, gospel perfect way. It's, we're dealing with wood and the variety of, of, um, of wood. Um, from George, is there a rip chain? Okay, love it. Rip chain. The biggest difference with rip chain is your top plate is going to be at 10 degrees. It's almost straight across. Why? Think about fiber. And I'm going to go back to my broom because I, I love this as, as a prop because it really, you can really understand what I mean by fiber, right? 
You can pull the fiber apart on wood like this, but try to cut it crossways it takes a lot of force. When we're ripping wood, okay, the top plate is cutting the ends of those fibers off. So that's really doing the work. The side plate, not so much. That's just popping. It doesn't even make a chip when we're, when we're ripping wood. It makes more of a sawdust. If we, just on that same page, if we've used a saw, try taking your chain and now taking, let me use the bar so it's a little more realistic, right? I'm gonna go this way. If you put your chain, you put your saw to a piece of wood this way and try cutting it, you're gonna get a pile of really long ribbons that'll actually jam up around the sprocket of your saw. It's because your chain is taking these ribbons and peeling them off like so. Okay, so it, it's all in understanding a piece of wood is a tightly bound bundle of long fibers. And then you can think about, okay, how is the, those cutting angles attacking them? And that will explain why those cutting edges uh, are shaped the way they are with ripping chain. Uh, uh, this is from Scott. Is there any different setup or consideration for an Alaskan chainsaw setup? Well, that, that's what I would consider ripping chain. When the, in Alaskan mills, right, you've got a saw, the way they're set up, you have a chain striking the wood this way, okay? So your top plates are cutting the ends of those, ends of that fiber off, and it really makes the saw dust. You, you don't get a good chip with, um, with that. And that's where you have the top plate is at 10 degrees. That's the way they designed that uh, ripping chain. And, and John, uh, also, is there any concerns with the gullets uh, with that, you know, cutting down the with the grain? Uh, should there be more or less? Uh, should we be skipping, uh, skipping a tooth when you're cutting with the grain? You know what I'm saying? Should be skipping? Because we were talking about the gullet setup, you know, that, you know, if, you were saying that it was more efficient if there's a bit more uh, room between the teeth. Okay, the semi-skip chain? Right. Yes, okay. Okay. So with the mill, I'm asking mill, okay? It's the same idea. It's gonna depend on how wide of a board are you trying to cut with your mill. If you're only cutting, say a, a log of, let me, let me give you some numbers, roughly, Okay, 20 inch bar and shorter, your set, your full comp chain works great. Okay. 20 to 30 inch bars, they recommend the semi-skip. And okay. then longer, you're going into that full skip. You need okay. even more chip carrying capacity. Okay, great. Thank yeah. you. That's the question. Yeah. yeah, same principle works with the mill. How many, how much sawdust or saw chip are, are you asking that chain to carry before it can get rid? Thank you. So, and uh, let's see. Yeah, uh, Hal actually is asking again about the video. I was going to put just put that on the screen. That's available through the new website, which is uh, woodlandtraining.com. Uh huh. I don't have it at the moment on my. Um, so if you just go to that website, woodlandtraining.com, right. uh, uh, you'll find that right on the home page, the video. I, I also put the link to that video in the comments. You did. Okay. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yep. It's in the first comment here. Yes. And again, there it is. Okay. So um, if you just want to check the, the chat here. For, um, for that website. So uh, another question from Spencer, is the correct diameter of the file listed on the box the chain comes in? Yes, what I recall seeing on boxes, they tend to give you uh, a range of chains and files. You need to be sure you're matching the chain that's in the box. Hopefully, 
whoever put the chain in the box actually would highlight, you know, right on the box, the chain that's in the box. That, Mike, oh, go ahead. No, it's, it's really confusing. It drives you nuts with what they've done with uh, saw chain and numbers. And then you've got a cross reference to the book and some are letters and every chain manufacturer wants to have their own code. And it, it, it really is, to me, it's foolish. It, they could simplify it so easily, but it is what it is. From Mike, can you explain square filing? <laughs> Um, yeah, okay, square filing, and I chuckle because I'm going to make this very, very brief. This is a whole nother world, okay? Square filing, oops, sorry, I got the wrong, wrong tooth here, and I'll put them side by side so you see the difference. I'll get it in the light. Square right there, okay? Screen left tooth is a square filed shape side plate. Okay, the other one, that would be your round file chain. By the way, John, left and right is reversed to us viewers as it is to you. Oh, I'm sorry. All right. When it I'll shows talk, on the screen. I'll talk my, my right and my left. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. There are there are three different style files, and you can go online and find this. I have I have a double bevel file here. There's a double bevel. There's a goofy, weird name, but this edge is a little bit rounded. And then there's a triangle file. Here's the main difference very quickly. It, it cuts faster and it holds its edge longer because there is no curvature to the side plate. It's straight up and down, or technically it's five degrees forward is what I like, okay? The top oops, sorry, the top cutting edge is only 15 degrees. So that working corner is stronger than round file chain. The chisel angle is actually, you can take that chisel down, chisel angle from, remember the side plate we talked about being 25 to 30 degrees, which is, think of that as the ramp that chip needs to climb. Square ground drops to 45 to 50 degrees down making it easier for that chip to get out of there. Add it all up and you have a faster, longer lasting cutting edge. With that said, <coughs> why in the world would we be round filing chain if square ground is faster and stays sharper longer? It has to do with the difficulty of hand filing. Round filing, and I'm, let me quickly go to a model, okay? Round, round filing. You watch folks file and they'll twist the file. They rock the file. Their arms, you know, they got all kinds of um, inconsistencies with the way they push that file. And with round file chain, you can get away with that and the chain is okay. With square file chain, you can't do that. When it's right, life is good. If it's not, and it's only the slightest bit off with your file, it's either gonna, the chain will act like it doesn't wanna cut any wood, or you get what we call, in the square ground world, we call it a bird's beak, okay? It would be something like, so this is that model of the too much hook, and we get a little bird's beak right there with the file. And you basically have a, a very chattery kind of chain. Your point dulls off really quickly, it doesn't work. So two reasons, difficult to hand file, takes a long time, lots of practice. I do mine with a grinder. Grinders are 1700 to $2,000 for the grinders. And even then you still need to know what you're doing. The, the grinder takes some of the human error out of it, but it is faster. It's much more accurate. And I hope that's enough of an answer without being here till midnight. But square ground chain is kind of my thing. I, I love it because it, it's, it's sweet, but it's a different world. 
from Timothy. Is there a difference between a chipper chain and a chisel chain? Thank you. So what's the difference? Thank you. And how does it compare to a safety chain? Oh, oh man, great. Okay. <laughs> I have two models. And if I hold those still, in my left hand is a chisel chain, full chisel chain. In my right hand, this one, is a semi chisel. The difference is full chisel means that top plate and that side plate are two flat edges that come together to a very distinct point. I call it a prick your finger point. That's full chisel chain. Semi chisel is where they take, and I think you can see it really well here. You'll see this corner here is slightly rounded. Okay. And you don't get that prick your finger point. What's the difference in the cutting performance? This is a little tricky to say, and I'm hoping you're going to follow me. Full chisel chain, if we're cutting the same wood with the same saw, okay, comparing chains, full chisel chain will cut faster, okay, but it has a vulnerable point to lose. Semi chisel doesn't cut as fast, but is less vulnerable because it does not have that point to lose. So you're, it's a compromise. If you want cutting speed, loggers, professional cutters, and so on, they're gonna, you're gonna see them running that full chisel chain, but they know they have to maintain that working corner. It's gotta be sharp. Very common to see the semi chisel chain put on the non-logger type saw. If you see them in the uh, uh, smaller saws tend to be. So I'm hoping that's answering your question now. It, it just doesn't have that very fine point to lose. So it's a little more forgiving in the cut in the uh, holding its edge, but it doesn't cut as fast. The other question had to do with that. I'm sorry, what was the follow up uh, on? A safety chain. How safety is that chain. Ah, yep. Yes, thank you. There is no such thing as a safety chain. Ain't out there. Chain is dangerous, okay? Here's my point. There are some things that they do with saw chains in the design. Most of it has to do with the depth gauges to make the chain a little safer. Safer. And what they are afraid of, as we mentioned earlier, folks who make chains, they are paranoid of a kickback injury. Okay. That's what they're trying to reduce. But the, the rock and the hard place that they're between, they need to sell a product that the customer is happy with. It needs to cut. It needs to do the job. So they can't make the chain so it has no kickback, but there are some things that they do to reduce that kickback. And one of them, I can show you here in this model, you see that green link, that there, when the chain is going around the tip of the bar, is actually helping to keep the chain away from the wood, okay, and reducing that cutting effect. So it reduces that kickback potential. Lot, it's actually um, kind of interesting when that kickback, it's not all from the cutting tooth, the cutting edges. That kickback, a lot of it is coming from the blunt front of the depth gauge. When that's striking that wood, that blunt cutting edge hitting that wood at 40 miles an hour, it sinks into the wood, stops, and, and the, the uh, bar is driven backwards or so they'll add that link in between. They will, um, this is a model of what's called Vanguard chain. And you can see what they've done to the depth gauge instead of it looking like your standard depth gauge on chain where it's kind of straight up and down, kind of thin. They've bent it over to give it that wider surface area. Again, trying to minimize that depth gauge from getting stuck in the log and then driving the chain in the bar backwards. So 
So, and there's a number, it's kind of difficult here. I, I know I've got real change. But I'm hoping I'm answering that question is, there are things they're doing to uh, try to help reduce the potential for that, that energy coming from a kickback without losing cutting performance totally. Thanks, John. There are quite a few more questions here. So uh, from Stuart, thanks for an excellent talk. If not too far off topic, would you be willing to share tips for knowing proper chain tension on the bar? Yeah, quickly. Okay, I can't demonstrate this the way we like to do it because I don't have the power head. Okay. I'll, I'll, I'll hope this works for you. you. With obviously with your bar and chain all set up, you got you pinch the chain halfway between the power head and the tip. So regardless of your bar length, just find that halfway point. Okay. And when you lift the chain, you'll actually start to pick the power head up. And this is going to be a little bit odd to try to, to try to sort of illustrate here, but you just brought the power head up onto the back end of the rear handle. Okay, that that's putting most of the weight of the power head will be pulling that bar down. And when you do that, ideally, we're going to see just a little bit of daylight under the drivers between the point of the driver and the top of the bar rail. So two or three of those, you have just a little bit of daylight underneath. Okay, and terminology quickly, I know we haven't talked about, here we go, drivers. Okay, when I talk about the point of the driver, that's what I'm talking about there. Those are the drivers there. Quick tip. If we're setting up our saw at room temperature, okay, and we do that little test, good chance that when you start cutting wood, within a minute or two, you're going to need to just crack your bar nuts loose and give that tension just a little tweak because the heat that that chain is going to expand that little bit and it'll get a little bit loose. So just keep that in mind um, between a, you know a, a room temperature chain and one that you, when you actually start to cut. Thank you. From Steve, what's the best device to hold a saw blade when sharpening in the woods and you don't have a vise? No, on our DVD, okay. Um, I don't know, if Dave, Dave's still with us? I don't know if you can show that. We have on that DVD cover on the back, we actually show a picture of the tools that we find are handy. And on there is a stump vise. And you can get these at saw shops. It is a uh, it's worth its weight in gold. Very simple little vise, two little points on it. You can drive it into a log, clamp, clamp your bar on it, and it, it really is nice to hold your bar still. And I'll tell you, that even works just simply on your tailgate or even at your workbench if you don't want to drive it into your workbench, just as a, um, a support to hold your bar. That's, that, I think, is uh, that's a given in the toolbox for um, sharpening chains. Here it is here. I'm holding it up right now. There you go. Oh, we don't have it on the screen, Dave. Uh -huh. Oh, wait. Let me see if I can share this. Is that what we're looking for? No. 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 Okay. No. Go I ahead. A, if I, I put a link to a stump vice in the comments. Okay. Stump vice. Now, there. Yep. Huh. Anyway. Well, you see my page, there it is. Okay. Uh, so, uh, uh, and a uh, question from Peter, do we have to file down the raker to get a deeper cut? To get a deeper cut, okay. I, I, you know, I always wanna be really careful with words because they do mean things. A deeper cut, I'm going to, assume that we're talking about a thicker chip. So yes, as you file the depth gauge down, or we call it you know, the nickname, so to speak, is the raker, you file that down. And the more the lower this is in relation to that top, your chip will become thicker. Just keep in mind, that, uh, one stroke with a good flat file will take three, four thousandths 
of a height off that depth gauge and very difficult to even see that but the difference in the reactive force, the power of those reactive forces, that pulling, pushing, and kickback are increased dramatically. So we, it's like imperative that you use the gauge. Um, I grew up around folks and they are still out there where they will freehand those depth gauges. You know, they just, you'll see them on the tailgate, just giving them a couple, three or four swipes or whatever. Please don't do that. Okay, use a gauge and make sure you get them right. The danger is if you get them down a little bit too low at the tailgate in your workbench and you go to the woods, okay, and they're too low, those chips are too thick, the reactive forces are dangerous, you're left really with uh, two options. As I always say, what are you gonna do? Okay, you, you, you already, you're out in the woods, you wanna get your job done. Well, one, you could change chains. Okay, well, you need the spare chain with you. Two, you could file all of those teeth back, make them shorter, and readjust the thickness of your chip. Chances are you don't have the time and you don't want to waste all that chain. What are we going to do? You got it. We're going to white knuckle the handlebars. We're going to move our, you know, our feet, will separate a little bit, and we're going to deal with it. We're going to sort of going to get by with it. And it causes tunnel vision. You know, we, we're, we're really focused on that saw because we all of a sudden it feels very dangerous. And it's a downward, spi downward spiral, spiral fast. Thank you. So uh, Michael's asking about the recording. So I will just mention, we are recording the webinar. Um, I will post this on our Vermont Woodlands YouTube page. It's still recording now, so all the questions and answers are there, and the chat, the chat um, text will also be available uh, if anybody wants that. So, um, you know, I have a list who, of who has registered and logged in, and I can let you all know when the recording is ready. So, uh, William wants to know how do you determine the first tooth to start sharpening? Or okay. does, does it matter? Uh, um, there are several questions here, John. You want to take them one at a time, or no, one at a time? I'm too old for, for any more than that. <laughs> okay. Okay. Here, here's here. I, I do see this a lot. You know, how, uh, you can use a marker, marking the tooth. Okay. Here's the way I kind of think of it. If you're sharpening the chain and you're doing something to the tooth, you're going to see it. So as you sharpen, move your chain ahead, you're going to come around. If you're looking at what you're doing and you're actually doing something, you're going to see that new shiny tooth come around. It's nice and sharp and it will be very obvious that um, you don't have to cut much wood at all and you're going to lose that real shine. But when you put a file across it, it shines back up and it's pretty clear that you've come all the way around. So will the right side chain teeth dull more quickly since they are on the lower side and closer to the ground? I wouldn't say so, no. Um, there's too many variables there. Um, it's it's going to be pretty even. I, I would acknowledge that occasionally, you know, I, I have hit a rock and sometimes just, you know, you may hit one side of your chain, hit the, hit the rock. And that definitely, you'll see that where one side of your chain is really damaged more than the other. But just cutting wood, I would say it's a pretty even deal. They're, they're going to be pretty equal. Thank you. Uh, and Michael says there's too much to take in here at one time. I'm, I'm with that. That's why we're, we're recording and you'll have a chance to review yeah. this. Uh, really interesting program, very well presented. Glad to see such good attendance. Thank you. For, oh, I can't tell who this is. Somebody who had to leave. So thank you. Uh, uh, William, Google sharpening chainsaws and you'll find a wealth of interesting videos. Um, that's a, a comment. Um, I don't know how if you want to respond to that, John, is there uh, good and bad out there on Google? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's, um, I call it the YouTube University of Higher Learning. There's 
we've looked at a lot of them. And, and when I say a lot, I'm talking easily dozens and there's probably hundreds of them out there. Some of them are okay, okay? They're fine. Some of them are flat out dangerous, okay? If, if someone who is really looking at these videos for information and they just simply mimic or do what's being suggested, it's like, that, that's nuts, okay? But here's, here's what's missing, okay? Unless we haven't seen it. And I, I, if I didn't mention this at the start, I'll mention it, I'll mention it now. This is why we wanted to do this video and this, this webinar. It's because we simply haven't seen a good presentation on how the tooth cuts the chip. What is it doing? Why is it shaped the way it is? Okay, and why do we modify it depending on you know, all the variables, the hardwood, softwood, big saw, small saw, uh, experienced users, and so on. Thank you. From Daniel, why does my saw sometimes cut crooked? Is it the filing <laughs> angle that's not correct? <laughs> it had to come. <laughs> oh, that is, that is so common. Okay, there's a couple of reasons that can happen, and one of them can be all of the above, okay? One of them can be simply that your bar rail has worn, okay? And it's what we call the gauge. It's that rail, it's that little groove that your chain sits into. If you notice when you buy a new chain and a new bar, the side motion of your chain is almost doesn't exist. Okay, it's very tight. I'm not, you know, it's a sweet spot, right? Obviously, the chain needs to slide lengthwise on on the bar, but you don't want to have uh, very much movement. Now you've got chain, you've got steel on steel here, lubricated by a little bit of bar oil, but this chain is traveling roughly 40 miles an hour. Okay, a saw, a modern saw is running wide open. And I just want to throw out this as a little uh, clarifier because I do hear this taught as chain speed is 60 miles per hour. That's true if the saw is wide open and not cutting anything. But when you put your saw to the wood and you draw your RPM down into about that 10,000, 10,500 RPM sweet spot at the peak of the power curve, you're looking at about a 40, 40 mile per hour chain speed. A saw will get roughly, on the average, 20 minutes of actual cutting time, right? Finger holding the trigger open, cutting time, 20 minutes out of a tank of gas. So do the math. 20 minutes at 40 miles an hour times how many tanks of gas. With that steel on steel, with that tiny little bar oil, you're going to get wear. You can't prevent it. It's going to happen and your chain will start to get sloppy sideways. That can be one cause for your chain to cut sideways. Now there's another reason, and I'm, I love the fact that we got to that because I get, I get to use my other prop. <laughs> okay, here's the other issue. We talked about keeping the top plate Okay, top plate, 25, 30 degrees, side plate, same thing. When we file by hand, very, very common that we have a comfortable side and an awkward side. Okay, whether you're right-handed, left-handed, how you hold the saw, workbench, tailgate, sitting on a log out in the woods, whatever. So it's not uncommon for one side of the chain to have a little bit different angle than the opposite teeth, okay? They're consistent on the same side, but they're different than the other side. So here's what I thought I'd do with the chisel bit, or excuse me, the uh, double bit ax. If I sharpen this side at a 25 degree angle, very sharp, 25 degree angle bevel on this cutting edge. On the other side, I file it at 30 degrees, five degree difference. Still sharp, but I have a 30 degree angle. Now, if I start chopping through a log, okay, 
The ax comes down onto the log with my 25 degree angle cutter. Then when I come up, I flip the ax over and I hit the other side with the 30 degree cutting angle. Exactly the same amount of energy, right? Because it's the same chain. And then I come up and I switch to 25, 30, 25, 30 at 40 miles per hour. And you see where that 25 degree angle is going to sink into that wood a little bit easier, a little more, a little further than the 30 degree angle because it's a little more blunt. And your the cavity that you'll start creating here is going to start getting skewed. Chain will start walking sideways. Okay. I'm hoping that helps. Thank you. So, uh, William, how do you determine the file size by the number on the chain? <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow. That, that is so frustrating because you, some chains, they're marked. Um, they're going to have numbers stamped. Some of them are stamped here on, the, on their drivers. Excuse me. Um, really, it's so frustrating that there's not a, good, a simple answer to that. You, you need to know the, the brand chain, the numbers on it, go to the box. Um, if, if you're really lost, I mean, if you want to, if you have a chain, you know it's the right chain and you want to replace it, be sure to just take it with you to, the, to your dealer and they'll just match it up and, and they'll help you out with it. Thanks. William also says one side of the chain is duller than the other. But you can maybe take that up with William another time. We have a lot of questions, yeah. uh, so let me um, let me see who this is from. Looks like George. Is there a rule of thumb to know the file diameter? Okay, we just kind of talked about that. Let me, Kathleen. Let me. I'm, I'm, I just thought of something else. Okay, file that proper file diameter. If if the file diam if the file you're using, when you put it to your chain, if you have about 20% of that file up and your side cutting edge leans forward that 25 degrees, that's going to work. Okay. So it's um, we, we can match numbers up, but really the the ant the the bottom line to all of this is look at the tooth. Are the angles correct? If not, what's going on? File, file too large, or is it the right size file, but it, you're filing too deep or too high? From John, why does everybody but steel use a 732nd inch file for 3 8 pitch chain, but steel calls for 1364 fourths? Is yep. there really a noticeable difference we're still just trying to be different. <laughs> <laughs> That's a very, very small difference in diameter between 732 and 1364. And again, look at the tooth. Okay, I, I'm hope I'm. Oops, let me go to this one and say, look at the look at the tooth. Look at your file. Is the file doing what you want it to do? Is the tooth shaped for what you want now that you know, I'm hoping that's uh, the goal of this you know, the presentation here is understanding what's it doing. If that's, if it's working right, you know, then who cares what the number is, as long as the tooth is, those cutting edges are shaped correctly. So John, you know, John also has a comment here about um, holding the saw in the woods. Uh, he's he's saying that he brings along one of those small military ammo cans yep. with a variety of chainsaw tools. Uh, is uh, one of the things I include is a stump vise. Yes. Yeah. Yep. So, uh, um, uh, oh, okay. And avoid the timber tough stump vise. Okay. Uh, 
Let me see. We got a lot of thanks here, John. Really good presentation. Uh, and John, I've taken GOL twice and I have your DVD, but this was still an informative review. Tons of chain sharpening videos on YouTube. The problem is many of those people have no idea what they're talking about. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> nice to know. Somebody knows something about depth. <laughs> So um, another question, many chains have one spot where there are two right teeth or two left teeth in a row. Um, okay. Make that the place where you start and finish your filing. Is that, 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 that's perfect, that would work. If, you know, that's some sort of uh, uh, abnormality, if you will, or something about the chain that your eye can identify when it comes back around. The reason that happens is it's just a sequence of the chain when they counted the drivers and split the chain to make the proper loop length for your bar. It just worked out that you ended up with, uh, say, two right teeth end to end. And it makes no difference the way it cuts. You'll never notice that. Okay. And this looks like a question. Do you recommend Oregon chainsaws? Oregon chain saws or Oregon chains. Chain. Sorry, chains. Yeah, yeah. Read that wrong. They all, you know, I use Oregon. Oregon has sponsored our training. Um, I like it. I've used steel. I like it. It works. There's other um, other chain manufacturers out there. Without. Um, going into dangerous territory. There is a very simple concept in business. If it is less money, there's a reason for that. Keep that one in mind. I've talked to some loggers that they're trying to uh, save some pennies and they're buying some other chain that's uh, significantly less money per loop. But when they get to the woods, they find out why that is. Mm -hmm. So here's another question here, Dick and Tess. How do you correct the angle on your cutting tooth if it starts to round up or back? Okay, now which cutting cutting angle? So uh, Dick, if you're still here, do you want to just pop in and clarify what your question is? Maybe not. Okay. Yeah, it's, it's tricky, tricky unless you understand the question. Yep. Yep. Okay. Um, oh, and here's from Mike Quinn. He needs to, uh, something I learned from you, John, I never sharpen chains in the woods. <laughs> I sharpen at home with light and a vice. And oh, take yeah. a pile of chains into the woods and a spare bar. <laughs> it's yeah. uh, it's a lot, real nice. I always say, you know, in the shop next to the refrigerator and the wood stove. <laughs> uh huh. <laughs> yeah. Uh huh. I want to see the saw that runs the teeth you used for props, and more than mm -hmm. that, I want to see the guy big enough to hold it. <laughs> <laughs> Those are great. Oh, and Dick says it's the cutting tip. That's what he's talking about. The when he said, the, yeah, the question about um, um, how do you correct the angle on the tip if it starts to round up or back? Okay, so if oh. we're I just get a straight edge here. All right. We're on the, on the tip, and I'm, I'm going to use, I'm hoping you know we're talking about that point. Okay, that to take it, to angle that back and strengthen the corner, you would raise your file up. You, you, as you file, you're going to want the file, again, about 20% of the diameter of the file should be above the top of the tooth. I'll try to hold that still there. Okay, let me go to the extreme. Sometimes doing the extreme makes the point better. That's 50% of the file is above the top plate. Whoop, hold still. Okay, that's 50%. Now, as I lower that, I'm trying to get about 20% of that file height, of file diameter above the top plate. 
And it has to do, maybe, maybe I'm, I wanna answer the question, how do we do it? It has to do with the pressure as you file across the tooth. And, and this, is, this is practice. It's trying to keep that pressure correctly. So you're not, as you're going across, you're not cutting down too much or up too much. So it's really pressure straight back to keep that file at its proper height. Let me quickly that we named our DVD, right? The art and the science of sharpening chain. The science is kind of like what we've been talking about, right? The science is the mechanics. How does this thing work? The art is getting that file in the hand and getting that pressure and that straight line. And I think that, you know, to me, a, a parallel is like playing a violin. I don't play a violin, but I mean, we can all understand the science, right? You push the ball across the strings, they vibrate, you make noise, that's the science. But the art takes practice before you can start to make music, right? It's pressure, touch, consistency, that takes practice. And can you recommend a good file guide? Steve wants to know. Yeah, I, now we weren't going, uh, you know, I didn't bring the file guides here because it really wasn't the uh, point of, of tonight. There's a roller guide. Dave, you, okay, we can go back to our picture. There's a, a little square unit, if you can see the picture, or a roller guide. There's two rubber rollers parallel to each other and that fits down on your chain. And I, you keep this in mind, okay? They're not, it's not like a perfect fit. Like you, you don't have to think about it. You still need to understand what that tooth is supposed to be shaped like. What is it doing? So that when we put those guides on our chain and start pushing that file, the way I say it is there are no PhD guides. PhD, right? Push here dummy. We need to understand what we're trying to do. The guides help us take some of the human error out of pushing that file across. It can help keep the height and so on. Thank you. So I think we're done with the with the questions. Walt is just yeah. wondering if he's going to have this uh, recording tomorrow when he's got his dull chainsaw on the bench and tools <laughs> in hand. So uh, no, it'll probably take a couple of days for us to get this packaged and put on YouTube, but when we have it ready, um, we will post it on the Vermont Woodlands YouTube. We'll send you a link to that. David, I don't know if you'll put it on the, on the Newt website uh, as something available for download or just link to our YouTube, uh, but we'll make sure it gets out there. There's a lot here to unpack and comprehend and you know, being able to go back and review it is, I'm sure, going to be very helpful. Well, thank you. Thank you. We've, been, we've been a long time wanting to get this in, get this down, recorded, you know, get, so it, um, we're hoping it's a, it's a useful tool as that the preemptive to put in the file, you know, buying the file, buying the gauges, what chain do I use, what size saw do I use, mm -hmm. you need to understand the mechanics of how that tooth works. Yeah, was excellent. John, you got nothing but kudos here. Excellent Thank presentation. You. Thank you, John. Yes, very informative. It helps. Um, I, yeah, I think it's I think it's time. It's 835. Um, I know you would keep answering questions, but I'm going to turn into a pumpkin here very soon. So I hear you. <laughs> <laughs> Kathleen, can I interrupt for a minute? Sure. I just want to say if people find this interesting, um, feel free to look at our website, woodlandtraining.com, um, and sign up for one of the levels. We have four levels of game of logging chainsaw training that gets into this kind of detail with everything from felling a tree to storm damage to you name it. Um, so we welcome you and we'd love to see you in the woods. Excellent. Thank you, David. Uh, Thank you, Kathleen. Yeah, and, and Vermont Woodlands as well, vermontwoodlands.org. Visit our website. Don't hesitate to become a member. Get our e-news. Find out all the other things we're doing, educational programs that are going on. 
I'm very grateful to uh, to John and David for reaching out to ask about doing this. It's wonderful to sponsor such a popular event and have so many folks show up. Lots of great knowledge we have here in the state of Vermont. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Thank you very much. Very good, guys. Take care. Yep. Good night, Take folks. Care. Careful out there. Yes. Stay safe.